Star. He was initially denied his high school diploma, but at long last, this is the moment, four years in the making for a North Carolina teenager. The reason for the four-day delay, the teen wore a Mexican flag over his graduation gown. His principal refused to give him that diploma at the ceremony. That move sparking outrage. More than 100,000 people signed an online petition demanding Ever Lopez be awarded what he worked so hard for. The controversy forcing police to beef up patrols at the high school. The big announcement by the DOJ tonight. Officials say they recovered a good portion of the ransom paid to those hackers to restart the East Coast pipeline, how they did it, and their message tonight for anyone trying to hold American companies hostage. Tonight, the nationwide drop in vaccinations. Can President Biden meet his goal of 70% of American adults vaccinated by July 4th? And why are fewer and fewer Americans lining up for a shot? A major move by the FDA tonight, approving the first Alzheimer's drug in 18 years, and despite controversy over how well the drug works. Tonight, our report on what's driving an increase in enrollment at historically black colleges and universities, even as college enrollment overall is down. Why do you think people are so surprised to hear this young man chose an HBCU over the Ivy? The world, unfortunately, underestimates HBCUs. After months of lockdowns in Paris, the concert experiment overseas tonight that could usher in a new era of music. 5,000 concert goers singing their favorite songs together. Good evening, I'm Kenneth Moten in for Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with a major announcement from the Department of Justice as the country and American companies continue to deal with more and more ransomware attacks. Officials today saying they have successfully recovered millions of dollars in cryptocurrency that Colonial Pipeline paid hackers to get its pipeline back up and running last month. The hack impacted oil up and down the East Coast for days, delaying flights and causing gas shortages. The deputy attorney general saying, quote, today we turn the tables on dark side. And she's also issued a warning for other companies. Pay attention now, invest resources now, or become a victim later. Senior White House correspondent Mary Bruce leads us off tonight from Washington. Tonight, the Justice Department announcing they've recovered millions of dollars in ransom money paid to dark side, the Russian hackers who shut down the colonial pipeline. Today, we turned the tables on dark side. The hack crippled pipeline operations for six days, triggering gas shortages and panic buying. The company ultimately paid the $4.3 million ransom. The CEO saying it was the right call. You don't want to pay these contemptible criminals, but our job and our, our duty is to the American public. It was the right decision to make for the country. The Justice Department now recovering $2.3 million by hacking the cyber criminal's Bitcoin wallet. Today, we deprived a cyber criminal enterprise of the object of their activity their financial proceeds and funding. These attacks have been on the rise. The nation's largest meat supplier, the target of a massive ransomware attack last week. The Massachusetts ferry to Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard also targeted. Earlier this year, New York's transit agency infiltrated by China. The Biden administration is now warning businesses to protect themselves, saying no company is safe. Pay attention now. Invest resources now. Failure to do so could be the difference between being secure now or a victim later. Our Mary Bruce joins us from the White House. Mary, many of these recent ransomware attacks are believed to have originated in Russia. So what's the White House saying on how President Biden will handle this issue when he meets with Vladimir Putin next week? Well, Kenneth, we know this is high on the agenda. The president does plan to confront President Putin about the issue of cybersecurity when they come face to face. Look, this administration views this as a national security priority. We know they are considering options for retaliation, and we are told that is a message that the president will deliver loud and clear to Putin next week. And Mary, also there in Washington, the clock is ticking on those talks on an infrastructure deal. What's the latest there, and is there a path forward to get a deal? 
That is a very good question. The White House insists there are several paths still available, one being a bipartisan compromise. The president does plan to talk tomorrow with the top Republican negotiator, West Virginia Senator Shelley Moore Capito. There's also the option that Democrats could simply go it alone. We know that on the Hill, Democrats are readying options to do just that. And then there's the really long shot option that they somehow come up with with yet another new bipartisan option. Look, the White House will say there are no firm deadlines here, but there is a very real sense that time is running out. And the White House today did concede time is not unlimited, nor is the president's patience to try and work out a compromise. Kenneth. All right, Mary Brewster, the White House. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. We turn now to a potentially major medical breakthrough, the FDA approving the first new treatment for Alzheimer's in almost 20 years. It's a monthly injection intended to slow cognitive decline in patients with early stages of the disease. And it's the first drug to treat Alzheimer's, not just the symptoms, but critics say there's not enough evidence the drug works. Here's ABC's Stephanie Ramos. Tonight, the first new drug approved for Alzheimer's in 18 years. The drug made by Biogen called aducanumab, brand name Aduhelm, is a monthly injection. This drug was given conditional approval by the FDA for patients with early stage Alzheimer's, so mild cognitive impairment, not a treatment, but hopefully will slow the progression of the disease. And it's the first to attack how the disease works, not just the symptoms, targeting a protein that's a biomarker for Alzheimer's. Jerry Taylor was involved in phase one of the trials. The effect on the drug, I believe, that it was helping me, and I'm very happy for the getting it back. And while advocacy groups pushed for the drug's approval, the FDA Advisory Committee and several prominent experts have doubts about whether the drug is effective, saying that even if it can slow the cognitive decline in some patients, it doesn't outweigh the risks of taking the drug, side effects that include brain swelling and bleeding. But the FDA approved it on the condition that Biogen conduct a new clinical trial while the drug is in use. The FDA could still rescind their approval if this new clinical trial fails. The FDA says they have weighed the risks and decided this was the right course of action. For the some 6 million people here in the U.S. dealing with the disease, some hope tonight. Kenneth. Stephanie Ramos there. Thank you for that report. For more now, we bring in ABC News medical contributor Dr. Darian Sutton. Dr. Sutton, great to see you, friend. And we'll get to the concerns in a minute, but let's talk about the drug's promise as the first to treat the disease and not just the symptoms. What does that mean for those suffering from Alzheimer's? Well, Kenneth, good to see you, too. To be honest, it's quite simple, hope. Uh, over 6 million people are affected by this disease within the United States, and unfortunately, there has been little treatments available. So many families are desperate in the need of a treatment, and unfortunately, that also does not allow many to see the possible concerns behind any possible benefit versus the risk of this uh, new medication. And as we heard, the drug was approved through an accelerated process. Tonight, there is a fierce debate over whether it works. Some critics say the risk may outweigh the benefits. Is there anything you've seen that should make Alzheimer's patients and their families concerned here? And so this is what provides an important moment to pause and have a discussion between patients and providers. From what we know, the FDA has approved this process, but that comes in opposition from the Independent Advisory Committee. And normally, these two groups historically agree before an approval happens. And the reason why that disagreement occurred is because these study trials, some of which have not shown clear benefit in this medication. And unfortunately, it doesn't come with its setbacks. Uh, notably, the medication is quite expensive, as the drug makers have established that it will likely cost about $56,000 per year. And there's also, there's some risks. Um, we've seen patients in these trials have very little things such as headaches, as much as brain swelling and bleeding. And so all of these things need to be taken into account when patients are trying to make a decision on whether or not they want to take this medication. Mm, those patients and their families go through so much there. Uh, before you go, Dr. Sutton, let's talk about another potential breakthrough. The FDA today approving the drug semaglutide to treat obesity. In clinical trials, more than half the subjects lost nearly 15 percent of their body weight. Could this drug be a game changer for seriously overweight people? 
Yes, there are many within the world of obesity medicine. My colleagues are telling me that this seems to be very much a game changer. Uh, currently, there are a few medications available for the treatment of obesity, and most of them provide a benefit of approximately 5 to 10 percent of weight loss. So that 15 percent that you quoted is quite substantial in our world. Um, but of course, we still have some setbacks with this medication, as unfortunately, obesity is most often not covered immediately by most insurance providers. And so many patients might be left trying to figure out how to pay for this drug. And so we'll still wait to see um, because the price has not been fully determined. All right, Dr. Sutton, with the information we need to know there, doctor, thank you. Thank you. We turn now to the coronavirus in this country and the promising new CDC data on the effectiveness of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. But the question tonight, how many Americans are getting vaccinated? Here's ABC's Marcus Moore. Tonight, new research shows just how effective COVID vaccines are in the real world. The CDC found the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines cut the risk of COVID infection by 91% two weeks after the second dose and 81% two weeks after the first dose. And for the few vaccinated people who got COVID, their illness was shorter, milder, and less likely to spread to others. <laughs> It comes as the White House ramps up the push to reach the president's goal. So Dr. Really Fauci today on right Kelly and Ryan we appearing optimistic. To, and we're going to hit 70 percent of the population, the adult population, by the 4th of July. 13 states have hit the goal. New York on track to reach it next week. When we hit 70 percent, then I feel comfortable saying to the people of this state, we can relax virtually all restrictions. The city announcing plans for a Central Park concert in August to celebrate its comeback. Legendary producer Clive Davis is expected to produce the show with speculation about the big names who will perform. But as shots across the country drop to under a million a day, in some places it's an uphill climb. Five states haven't even reached half their adults with one shot. Cases in Alabama rising nearly 90 percent in the last two weeks. Our numbers have increased back towards 400 or 500 cases a day, and I'm sitting a little bit on pins and needles right now. If we see our cases increasing to 1,000 or higher, that means we definitely fail the Memorial Day stress test. With another big test looming for the fourth, over the weekend, another reminder of the risks. Golfer John Rahm bending over with disappointment when he learned he had tested positive for COVID, forced to withdraw from the Memorial Tournament. Rahm was leading by six strokes and could have won nearly $1.7 million. Rahm saying on Twitter he was disappointed but thankful he and his family are okay and that he will take all the necessary precautions to be safe and healthy. Let's get to Marcus Moore now. Marcus, Dr. Anthony Fauci there says we will meet the president's vaccination goal, but tell us about that new Gallup poll that illustrates some of the challenges. Yeah, hey, Kenneth, the, the, the poll is, is pretty jarring, actually. I mean, you, you consider that according to this poll, that nearly 80 percent of the people, Americans, who uh, don't plan to get vaccinated are unlikely to change their minds. And that leaves just one in five Americans who are, are reluctant to get vaccinated, Kenneth. Um, according to this poll, uh, just one in five say that they are open uh, to reconsidering. So certainly um, a steep hill as far as trying to reach that goal. No, definitely. And as you reported, some states have much lower vaccination rates than others. Do experts have explanations for these disparities? Uh, well, well, Kenneth, there's a, a few things at play here. Uh, it is political. They say a number of the, the states uh, that are seeing these lower rates uh, did vote for, for Trump, but it's also an issue of, of access. Uh, the communities that uh, don't have access either to the vaccines or people living uh, 15 minutes or more away from an area where they can get vaccinated. And then um, a, a third element that's at play here is just overall reluctance. Um, people who just simply uh, aren't comfortable right now uh, with getting a vaccine, and it's something that uh, officials are hoping to change. Kenneth. All right, Marcus Moore there with that important breakdown. Marcus, thank you, sir. Well, next, Vice President Kamala Harris is tackling her biggest assignment yet, trying to stem the tide of migrants from Central America. Today, she was in Guatemala as part of her first foreign visit, meeting with the country's president and sending the direct message, do not come to those thinking about making the journey north. ABC's Matt Gutman has reported many times on the dire conditions in Guatemala and other parts of the Central America that have helped drive the migrant surge. He's tracking the latest from the vice president's trip. Tonight, Vice President Kamala Harris in Guatemala with a message. Do not come. Do not make that journey. 
I want to be clear to folks in this region who are thinking about making that dangerous trek to the United States-Mexico border. Do not come. Do not come. This year, more than 96,000 migrants from Guatemala alone have been apprehended at the border, 21,000 of them unaccompanied minors, more than from any other country. The goal of our work is to help Guatemalans find hope at home. This is her first foreign trip as vice president, and tonight she has pledged help from the U.S. to fight corruption and crime, which drive thousands to make that journey north. We want to make sure that this is about transnational crime, and we have to follow the money, and we have to stop it. Protesters greeting Harris with their own message. Signs saying, Kamala, they're lying to you. Corruption plus poverty plus impunity leads to migration. For weeks now, we have been reporting on the hardships so many face here. On our journey, we met these children who say they are hungry. Para cena. Tortilla, solo tortilla? Con algo solamente tortilla? So Nelson is 11, Aline is 12, and they are about the size of my six-year-old. These children telling me they've never eaten meat in their lives. Matt Gutman joins me now. Matt, we also have exclusive details today on an upcoming report by the Biden administration on families separated at the border during the Trump administration. What have we learned? It's an especially shocking report, Kenneth, because previously everybody had been told that there are only, only 1,700 children who were separated from their families at the border during the Trump administration. This is that uh, zero tolerance policy that forcefully separated families. Now the administration is saying that they've continued this investigation. They now believe that there are over 3,900 kids who were separated from their families. And just to give you a perspective of how long it has taken to reunite these families, Families. Uh, there are about 400 kids, according to the government, who've been repatriated outside of, their, uh, of this country with their families. In the U.S., only 62 kids have been reunited with their families. So there is a long way to go here, and you can only wonder and think about how much pain this has caused these families, Kenneth. Definitely thinking about all those families. Matt Gutman there. Thank you. And now to that horrible and deadly road rage incident in California. Six-year-old Aiden Leos was shot and killed in the back seat of his mother's car. Authorities have now arrested Marcus Aries, the alleged shooter, and his girlfriend, who was allegedly driving. Here's ABC's Will Carr. Tonight, after two torturous weeks, a major break in the case of that deadly road rage shooting in California that left six-year-old Aiden Leos dead. Authorities arresting 24-year-old Marcus Anthony Ares and 23-year-old Winley, the alleged driver. We had hundreds of tips from the public. It was extremely helpful. The California Highway Patrol speaking just moments ago. There are few words to describe the feeling produced by the despicable actions of that day. Tonight, investigators are combing through Ares' social media, including these Instagram videos of the suspected killer. Ares seen firing a rifle, a shotgun, and a handgun. Neighbors telling our station KABC he had guns hanging on the wall of his home. The couple's arrest comes just days after young Aiden, the boy with bright eyes and a big smile, was memorialized. To my Aiden, I love watching you sleep in the morning as you're the most beautiful boy I've ever seen. Aiden shot while his mother was driving him to school, the bullet piercing the trunk of their car, hitting Aiden in the back as he sat in his booster seat. He died bleeding in his mother's arms. His sister says his last words were, Mommy, my tummy hurts. Aiden laid to rest today. My precious son had his life ripped away from him for absolutely no reason. They took his life and my heart along with it. Those words from that mother, just so tough to hear. Just a devastating story. Will Carr joins us from Orange County, California, where what more, Will, do we know about these suspects? Well, Kenneth, authorities just laid out the gut-wrenching details here. They say that they have been pleading for those suspects to turn themselves in for the past two weeks here. Obviously, they did not turn themselves in. It was tips from the public that helped lead to this arrest. And now that they are behind bars, authorities are saying that they have zero sympathy for them, thinking about the charges and possible sentencing moving forward. Kenneth. And, Will, what have you heard about the next steps in this case? 
So uh, both suspects are behind bars. They both have uh, each a $1 million bond, and they're set to appear in court first thing in the morning. Uh, authorities have not announced the charges yet. They say they could be facing up to murder. Uh, so that is how seriously they are taking this. And they do say they have the gun and they have the car that were used in this shooting. Kenneth. All right. Will Carr there in Orange County, California. Will, thank you. Now tonight to the first heat wave of the season here on the East Coast, breaking more records tonight and triggering heat advisories. Temperatures in the 90s from Delaware to Maine. People packing the Atlantic Coast beaches the most since the pandemic at Asbury Park, New Jersey. Searing heat worsening the drought in California. Folsom Lake Reservoir there at 68 feet lower than normal. ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is here. And Rob, any relief on the way? Uh, maybe a little bit, uh, Kenneth, but there was another day of records in this early June heat wave, especially in the Northeast. As you mentioned, nearly everybody into the 90s. Take a look at these numbers. Uh, records falling in Burlington and Plattsburgh, New York, in Bangor, Maine. Nearly all the big cities in Maine breaking records with temperatures into the mid-90s. This is striking stuff. You couple in the humidity and the heat advisories are up for the big cities of Boston, of Hartford, of Philadelphia. We do cool it down maybe a, a few degrees tomorrow in the Northeast. You might not notice it all that much, uh, but the the upper Midwest, this is what's been really unusual in Pierre and Fargo and Minneapolis. These guys have been working on 90, 100 degree plus days here for nearly a week. This could go down as the longest stretch of early June heat for Minnesota with not a whole lot of relief really until we get to Thursday or Friday. Uh, you mentioned the drought. You showed, showed those pictures in, 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 in the West. And here's the drought monitor, what we, what we look at every week. And freshly updated, 75% now of California is under extreme drought. But Look at the Four Corners region, parts of Nevada and Utah under exceptional drought. And this map, Kenneth, is not going to get any less red as we get into the summer. The uh, rainy season has moved well to the north. Just, just incredible there in that heat. Those numbers, those temperatures can be very dangerous. So I hope people stay safe. Uh, Rob, I want to get to this before you go. The government is out with its annual report on CO2 levels, and it paints a grim picture as to where we stand in our fight to slow climate change. Yeah, you know, we... They, they measure this uh, every year, actually every day, but this past month, the measurement taken in May and Mauna Loa, they take it at the top of the volcano there on the big island of Hawaii, uh, measured 419 parts per million. And really all you need to know is that since they've been keeping records of this since 1958, and there's the map, um, this is the highest level it's ever been. And you see that progression uh, and steady trend upwards. That's not a good uh, sign for climate change. You add a CO2, you're going, to, you're going to warm the atmosphere. And that's what we've seen. That, those little iterations up and down, that just happens yearly. Everything kind of peaks in the spring when all everything flowers and, and leaves out and then, then goes down. But the overall trend is one that goes to the north. And everyone, of course, asking about this current drought, which is ongoing, and this current early June heat wave. And yeah, I mean, both have a high confidence level of being a direct link to climate change, unfortunately. Yeah, correlation yeah. there. All right, Rob Marciano, thank you. Now to the man who's so rich, he's leaving planet Earth. Amazon founder Jeff Bezos says he'll fly to space on his own rocket ship in July. But who will be joining him? Here's ABC's Victor Okendo. Even for one of the richest people in the world, the stakes are high. You see the Earth from space, it changes you. Jeff Bezos announcing on Instagram he's flying next month in a rocket made by his company, Blue Origin. It's a thing I've wanted to do all my life. It's an adventure. It's a big deal for me. Bezos will be on board the first human flight of the 59-foot New Shepard rocket near the edge of space, 60 miles above Earth. Total flight time, a mere 11 minutes, three of them spent in zero gravity, no spacesuit required. Only six seats in the capsule, each with a window. Bezos revealing one of his travel partners, his brother Mark. I really want you to come with me. Would you? Are you serious? I am. Blue Origin conducting more than a dozen successful test flights with no one on board. One seat on Bezos's flight will go to the winner of a month-long auction currently in progress, that money to be donated to Blue Origin's Club for the Future, a science education fund for children, bidding already soaring to over $3.5 million as of tonight. And let's bring in Victor Okendo. Victor, what do we know about the timing of this flight? Kenneth, the timing is pretty interesting here for a few reasons. Bezos will be flying into space just 15 days after he steps down as the CEO of Amazon. The flight is on the 20th of July. That's also the 52nd anniversary of the first Apollo moon landing.
Kenneth? Pretty symbolic there. All right, our thanks to Victor Okendo. And I'm not sure Jeff Bezos' brother seemed too happy to be going up into space, but uh, have a good trip. When we come back, the high-speed chase on a California freeway and the unusual moment the suspect stopped to get gas. Unanimous Supreme Court ruling that deals a blow to tens of thousands of immigrants with temporary protected status will explain. But up next, thousands of people taking part in this high-stakes study that could tell us a lot about the risk of attending a concert in the age of COVID. Stay with us. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime. 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. Reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. In Australia, where I live, We've just had the worst spate of fatal shark encounters in a century. As someone who loves sharks and being in the water, why do you think they're coming closer to shores? I want to find out if we can live together without doing each other harm. Coexisting is really important. I couldn't agree with you more. They will come close. Don't make sharp movements. Should I be nervous? Oh, wow. The biggest shark fest ever begins with the premiere of Shark Beach with Chris Hemsworth, Monday, July 5th at 9 on National Geographic. Take a look at this dangerous chase through L.A. County earlier today. The suspect hit speeds up to 100 miles per hour on the freeway. But there was this moment when he actually stopped. Yeah, that's right, to get gas. The suspect actually grabbed the hose from another driver there and filled right on up. He was arrested a bit later after driving into a garage. Incredible. Here in the U.S., officials have been pulling out the stops, trying to ramp up vaccinations with incentives like money or free education. But in many EU nations like France, most believe vaccine hesitancy is so strong that this won't work. With tourists now planning summer vacations and residents there trying to resume life, this poses a challenge. How do you reopen safely in a world where not everyone is vaccinated? And how do you make places like museums or concerts safe? E.T. some skin food was Recently given access to a high stakes experiment, though, thousands invited to a concert there. The residents could dictate what live music looks like across the continent. When the lights go out and the crowd goes, you know something special is about to happen. It's amazing. After months of lockdown in Paris, 5,000 concert goers dancing in unison to their favorite song. All in the name of science. For Lisa Sade, an opportunity to have a sense of normalcy. There was a nostalgia of, oh, we're all back together at the same time. Harris holding this giant experimental concert just days ago to learn about the risks COVID poses at big events. No social distancing, but all attendees have to wear masks 
and get tested. What if the results that come back are not good? We don't, uh, that's not an option. French authorities spending over a million dollars on the initiative for a team of scientists to compare 15,000 tests of participants with regular Parisians. That's just one part of the scramble in Europe as it gears up for a return of tourists. La première destination. The first destination Americans are looking to come to is Paris. And when people come to Paris, it's for the Parisian lifestyle. Outdoor cafes are back, which is a huge part of our identity. People also need to be able to go to museums to see live shows. France announcing it will open its doors to vaccinated Americans on June 9th. France, like the rest of Europe, badly needs tourist dollars this summer. The EU economy shrinking 6.8 percent over the last year. It means that despite some COVID restrictions, Paris's biggest sites are reopening. The Louvre welcoming visitors again, but the most popular museum in the world still operating at half capacity. This is a very strange sight. This room usually is packed with visitors. The queue normally goes all the way to the back of the room with people eager to take a look at the world's most famous painting, the Mona Lisa. It's quite nice to sort of experience it yeah. in its bare bones form. It's very nice. We feel pretty lucky. Yeah, very lucky. In the U.S., some states reopening by making offers like the chance to win the lottery. We will start with number 18. And free sports tickets to get more people to take the jab. The French government here taking a different approach. In France, that wouldn't work. It would be very badly received by a part of the population that would say, well, wait, if they are trying to convince me to get a vaccine in exchange for retribution, that means that the vaccine is not good enough in itself. This experiment could be a turning point. In just days, Lisa Sade's test will help determine how France, like much of the world, will return to normal. If scientists can prove the rate of transmission didn't increase, it means France and Europe can soon party again. I just enjoy really having a lot of sweaty people next to me and, and getting in the vibe. It was really nice. It's Sam Genfood in Paris for ABC News. College enrollment applications are down at many universities, but not at several historically black colleges and universities where they are soaring. We take a closer look at why. Tinder is out with a new feature for those who don't want to see their exes on the app. And we take a look at the first senior royal born in the U.S. by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, Simone Biles. Seven championships now. Wow. Go give her a retweet. We'll be right back. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming.
With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America. America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. ABC News, honored, winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Welcome back. Now to the new royal baby, Prince Harry and Meghan announced the great news over the weekend, the birth of their daughter, Lily Bet Diana Mountbatten-Windsor, who they'll call Lily for short. We take a look now at Lily's royal lineage by the numbers. She's eighth in line to the British throne, pushing Prince Andrew and Princess Beatrice and Princess Eugenie down the line of succession. Lily, named after Queen Elizabeth, is the monarch's 11th great-grandchild and the fifth grandchild of Prince Charles and the late Princess Diana. Lily is the first senior royal born right here in the U.S. and the first great-grandchild of the queen to be born outside the United Kingdom. She's also the first baby born to the royal family since the death of Prince Philip in April at the age of 99. Lily is two years younger than her big brother, Archie. The royal couple told Oprah Winfrey and Marcia, with this baby, quote, two is it, and they don't plan to have another child. Congratulations, and we wish them all the best. And we have a ton to get to here on Prime. Return to normal, the first cruise ship in North America sets sail for the first time since the lockdowns began, and paying tribute the man believed to have been the last surviving liberator of Auschwitz. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. He will guide you through it all tonight. We have made it through another week together. Big hug, really. We taught all our patients how much they love to hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. In Australia, where I live, we've just had the worst bait of fatal shark encounters in a century. As someone who loves sharks and being in the water, why do you think they're coming closer to shores? I want to find out if we can live together without doing each other harm. Coexisting is really important. I couldn't agree with you more. They will come close. Don't make sharp movements. Should I be nervous? Oh, wow. The biggest shark fest ever begins with the premiere of Shark Beach with Chris Hemsworth, Monday, July 5th at 9 on National Geographic. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline.
Tonight, the Justice Department announcing they've recovered millions of dollars in ransom money paid to Darkside, the Russian hackers who shut down the colonial pipeline. Today, we turned the tables on Darkside. The hack crippled pipeline operations for six days. The company ultimately paid the $4.3 million ransom. You don't want to pay these contemptible criminals, but our job and our, our duty is to the American public. It was the right decision to make for the country. Today, we deprived a cyber criminal enterprise of the object of their activity, their financial proceeds and funding. The nation's largest meat supplier, the target of a massive ransomware attack last week. The Massachusetts ferry to Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard also targeted. Earlier this year, New York's transit agency infiltrated by China. Pay attention now. Invest resources now. Failure to do so could be the difference between being secure now or a victim later. A unanimous Supreme Court has ruled that thousands of people who enter the U.S. illegally and were assigned temporary protected status cannot apply for a green card unless they were first lawfully admitted at a port of entry. Temporary protected status, the decision said, does not make an unlawful entrant eligible to become a legal permanent resident. As many as 600,000 people from 12 countries fall under the program, many of them, especially from Central America, are undocumented. Former Soviet soldier David Dushman has died. He is believed to have been the last surviving liberator of Auschwitz, driving his tank through the concentration camp's electric fence in 1945. He said he didn't learn about the atrocities there until after the war. David Dushman was 98. After such a devastating period of infection and death, India's starting to slowly lift its lockdown restrictions. Seeing the number of cases going down, and when like the count is less than 500, so uh, I really feel I mean, like very optimistic. At its peak last month, the country had more than 400,000 new cases a day. The infections and deaths are declining now, and the government's trying to restart the economy. It feels good. We're in our houses for a long time, safe and secure. Now we have stepped out with safety. It remains to be seen how the customers' responses will be after reopening. The latest figures showing them at their lowest level in two months, but still more than 100,000 cases a day. That's nearly 29 million cases overall, second only to the United States. But today, some businesses and shops are allowed to reopen and limited public transport's running again. But vaccination rates in India are still woefully low, with less than 5% of more than 1 billion people fully protected. Tinder's new block contacts feature, it allows users to avoid familiar faces from their contacts list who are also on the dating app. Over 40% of Tinder users say they've seen an X on a dating app. Tinder's block contacts launches today. That could also include your parents and siblings because that's just awkward. Next to the outrage after one student was not given his diploma as he walked across the stage because he was displaying a medical or excuse me, a Mexican flag. He said it was a source of pride for his family over how far he's come. But his school said he broke the rules. Rena Roy has more. High school graduate Ever Lopez now has his hands on his hard earned diploma, picking it up from his North Carolina high school after he says he was temporarily denied it for wearing a Mexican flag over his graduation gown. It means the world to me, you know. I feel real grateful now that I have it. Lopez was eager to grab his diploma last week. Instead, he was denied by school officials, and he and his family were escorted away by police. His mother also speaking out. A community advocate translating in English. Because we believe that any student, wherever they're from, has a right to be able to express themselves. Ashboro High School says Lopez violated the dress code. In a statement, the district saying the incident is not about the Mexican flag, adding it supports our students' expressions of their heritage in the appropriate time and place. Police say the school has received at least 10 emails threatening violence, one saying, I'm going to shoot up this school if you don't give that young man his diploma. Over the weekend, a similar situation in San Antonio, Texas. Ashley Saucedo 
escorted out of her graduation after also displaying a Mexican flag. You can see her in this live streamed video taken last week at the Southwest Legacy High School graduation ceremony. If I would have had taken out a Texas flag, an American flag, the school would have taken it way differently. In a statement, the school says in part, we support all students who want to display pride in their heritage and culture, adding students are made aware that props like flags are not allowed at graduation to avoid any disruptions. All right, thanks, Serena Roy there. Tonight, Boston's police commissioner is out of a job. Mayor Kim Janey has fired Commissioner Dennis White, saying the public has lost trust in his judgment amid allegations of domestic violence. There are reports White admitted hitting and pushing members of his household. Mayor Janey calling her decision an inescapable conclusion. He was placed on leave in February after just two days on the job. White has repeatedly denied the allegations. Today, more than a dozen people were injured in a bus accident here in New York City. Authorities say at least 16 people were hurt when the MTA bus jumped a curb and crashed into an apartment building in Brooklyn. The MTA is investigating reports the driver's foot may have become stuck between the brake and the accelerator. Everyone is expected to recover from their injuries. For the first time since the pandemic began, a North American cruise ship has set sail with paying passengers on board. The passengers were vaccinated. And that has caused tensions with the governor of one state. Gio Benitez was in Barbados, where that ship docked earlier today. Hey there, Kenneth, and welcome aboard the Celebrity Millennium in Barbados. You know, we've been sailing all weekend long to show you what a cruise now looks like. Let's go ahead and take you up into the air with our drone cam right here so you can see exactly what this looks like. Uh, the passengers right now, they are excited, but they're actually on the shore there in Barbados on their excursions. Right now, there's about a 30% capacity here on this ship. A celebrity says they're trying to keep it low just to start, but I got to tell you, every single adult passenger on this ship and every crew member is vaccinated. So that is the biggest change here, right? Before you board, they actually have to see that physical vaccine card, not a photo of it. They need to see your negative PCR test before you board because you're also dealing with local governments, right? With all the different islands. Uh, the other big change is the dining hall, perhaps uh, the most popular part of any cruise ship, right? And that is usually a self-serve buffet kind of style, not on this ship and perhaps not on other ships because they're going to be going ahead and having crew members give you the food. So those are some of the biggest changes. For passengers, masks are not required right now. But for crew members, they actually are still wearing that mask even though they are fully vaccinated. So lots of big changes. And one of the big questions right now is what happens if someone were to test positive while on board, positive for COVID? Well, they do have a plan in place for that because they have a medical facility here, two doctors on board. 11 nurses on board. And if someone were to test positive, they move that person into an isolation cabin, the sort of cabin that's just designated just for that. And they go ahead and they move them into there. And then they go ahead and do all of the contact tracing. So, you know, there's a lot of changes, uh, but we're going to be seeing what happens over the next few weeks and months, because in July, once we start seeing more cruise lines sail from the U.S., we're going to have to see if uh, the state of Florida is going to allow uh, those cruise lines to mandate vaccines on board. Right now, that is the mandate from the CDC. There's a legal battle going on between the Florida governor and the CDC. So a lot of people just don't know what's going to happen, but we are going to be watching that for you. Kenneth? All right, Gio Benitez there on that beautiful ship. Thank you, Gio. All right, next to our look at the states offering cash incentives to get people back to work. Rachel Scott has more. At Concord Food Co-op in New Hampshire, manager Chris Gilbert says hiring has never been a problem until now. How challenging has it been to even just to get people to apply? Very challenging. I've been doing this for 30 years and I've never seen it like this. His kitchen now closed. Not enough workers to prepare the food. The store hours are reduced. They don't have the staff to keep the doors open. What do you fear most about this? Losing the sales enough that I have to start letting people go that, you know, in the long run, we have to close up. Nationwide, millions are unemployed, but hiring has slowed. So now governors in six states are offering residents up to $2,000 to get back to work. We're just stepping in. We're saying, look, let us take that burden, allow folks the opportunity, make it equal across the board, regardless of what you're going to do. We're not going to discriminate by what your job might be. We're going to make sure it's available to everybody. 
New Hampshire is one of 25 Republican-led states moving to slash federal unemployment benefits for millions this summer. Jeff Bankel, who owns a bakery with his family in Arizona, says those weekly checks are part of the problem. Are you really going to bust your butt for 40 hours a week for an extra 60 bucks? For a lot of people, the answer is no. Economists insist that's only a small piece of the puzzle, pointing to other factors like lack of child care and concerns about COVID-19. But some states are stepping in to help with that, too. Arizona's governor is giving out a one-time bonus of $2,000 and three months of child care assistance for those who return to work, keeping small business owners optimistic. I had doubled the size of the bakery in 19, and we were doing better than we ever had. And we're still not back where we were, but the end is in sight. We'll get there. We will get there. All right, our thanks to Rachel Scott there. They are institutions rich in history and culture in America, historically black colleges and universities. And while we've reported right here on the drop in college admissions at so many schools, at HBCUs, enrollment applications are up, way up. What's fueling the surge? We take a look and introduce you to an incredible young man. It's the time when high school graduates make that consequential decision. What's next? You did it. I know. You made it. Curtis Lawrence has made his choice. I was excited to go with SAMU. Behind those braces and that megawatt smile is a gifted 16-year-old who's about to be a high school graduate. How'd you get so smart? Well, it's really uh, a product of my parents. They started me out early and made sure that I had the tools I needed to succeed. Reading by two, kindergarten at four, skipping grades by seven. Capoeira, Afro -brasileira. Capoeira. Curtis practices capoeira, Afro-Brazilian martial arts, plays piano, even speaks fluent Mandarin. Hi, I'll be going to college to study biology. Curtis was offered $1.6 million in scholarships and accepted into 14 schools, including Harvard and Yale. But his pick, Florida A&M University. They made sure to reach out to me to provide me with the opportunities that say, I know that I will be welcomed at FAMU. I know that FAMU is the right choice for me. There are people who know the value of an HBCU, especially like FAMU. How did you realize that value? So throughout my life, my parents made sure to make me interested in HBCUs and that they were the place for me to be developed as a young black man. From academics to athletics, Athletes have also turned heads with their commitments to HBCUs. During the social unrest, the George Floyd killing, that was definitely was a tipping point of everything. That, that, that really, you know, made me, you know, consider HBCU seriously. Last year, one of the most elite basketball prospects in the country, McCore Maker, shocked the nation, turning down top basketball programs like Kentucky and UCLA. He became the highest ranked player in the modern recruiting era to commit to an HBCU, choosing Howard University. You have those big schools in your mind that are known for getting those top recruits right into the NBA, but you chose a school that people were a little surprised about. You chose Howard. Why? It's always hard when you're trying to pick the right college and the right fit or style of play or, you know, the right culture. But I feel like when I, whenever I'm given the opportunity with a wide variety, whether to lead and learn at the same time, it's a no-brainer for me. McCor says he wanted to give others the courage to go with their hearts. After his decision, star athletes like the sons of rapper Master P and NBA legend Shaquille O'Neal both committing to HBCUs. What does that feel like? It feels great. Um, I'll explain this example. It's like, you know, when you throw a rock in the in lake, you watch it, you know, ripple. I feel, I feel like the rock, when you throw it in the lake, you watch the ripple effect. That's exactly how I feel. Like Curtis and McCor, a growing number of young people, especially those of color, choosing historically black colleges and universities. HBCUs started rising up in the early 19th century to educate people of African descent, including free slaves and their descendants, who were not allowed to attend white institutions. Many HBCUs surviving decades of racist-based challenges. Jim Crow, underfunding accreditation issues. Why do you think people are so surprised to hear this young man chose an HBCU 
over the IVs. The world, unfortunately, underestimates HBCUs. With the racial climate that's happening across, that's been happening in America, parents want to know that their children are going to be safe on the campus that they're, they're at, where they're learning. Howard University says for a third straight year, it's experienced a double-digit increase in applications. Morgan State University reported nearly 15,000 people apply for undergrad, an all-time high. As colleges overall saw a nearly 3% dip in enrollment this spring compared to last year during the pandemic, HBCUs are exploding in popularity. Beyonce is shining a light on the HBC culture at Coachella. There's been more attention on celebrity HBCU alumni like Oprah and Vice President Kamala Harris. And then there's the racial reckoning. At Bowie State University, Dr. Aminta Bro, the first black woman to lead Maryland's oldest HBCU, says since 2016, Bowie State has seen a 70% increase in applicants from across the country. Our doors have been open to every race, uh, every gender, uh, and orientation. Uh, we are an open, diverse community, and we feel that it, there's a greater benefit to us all. Bowie State and Maryland's other HBCUs are now preparing for a major infusion of cash to help with expansion plans. $577 million approved by the state for years of underfunding. I believe this is a wrong that has been uh, righted. And so now we're looking to the future to build up our programs, to create greater academic innovation, to provide the scholarships so sorely needed for our students as we see a growing gap. Uh, across the country. Curtis Lawrence the third. As Curtis prepares to graduate from high school, the 16-year-old has already earned his associate degree from George Washington University, which means he'll join FAMU as a rising junior. What do you want other young people to know about HBCUs? For young people, I would say that HBCUs are where you should go. They have a specific culture to them that other schools don't exactly have, that they can't match. Shout out to those FAMU Rattlers and congratulations to Curtis. His family is proud. We all are. Before we go tonight, the image of the day, because even elephants need to take a nap every now and again. This herd was pictured in Southwest China. These elephants are protected in China and their population is set to be on the rise. Well, that's our show for this hour. Stay with ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Kenneth Moten in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks for streaming with us. And coming up in the next hour, we'll, we're staying on top of these stories. President Biden trying to get his infrastructure bill across the finish line. We know about the challenges he has convincing Republicans, but what about skeptical Democrats? And the Louisiana city that has had quite the year for all the wrong reasons. Two hurricanes, an ice storm, a historic flood. Our Rob Marciano traveled to Lake Charles to see how their comeback is coming along. In Australia, where I live, we've just had the worst spate of fatal shark encounters in a century. As someone who loves sharks and being in the water, why do you think they're coming closer to shores? I want to find out if we can live together without doing each other harm. Coexisting is really important. I couldn't agree with you more. They will come close. You don't make sharp movements. Should I be nervous? Oh, wow. The biggest shark fest ever begins with the premiere of Shark Beach with Chris Hemsworth, Monday, July 5th at 9 on National Geographic. powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime. 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC.
It's all about you. In Australia, where I live, we've just had the worst bait of fatal shark encounters in a century. As someone who loves sharks and being in the water, why do you think they're coming closer to shores? I want to find out if we can live together without doing each other harm. Coexisting is really important. I couldn't agree with you more. They will come close. Don't make sharp movements. Should I be nervous? Oh, wow. The biggest shark fest ever begins with the premiere of Shark Beach with Chris Hemsworth, Monday, July 5th at 9 on National Geographic. She's not afraid of a fight. Erin was Rocky in a miniskirt. If Barbie and Wonder Woman were one person. A rebel, a fearless crusader. It's worth the fight. And a single mom. When I first sat down with Erin and Elizabeth Brockovich, I wasn't so sure that this story would have a Hollywood ending. Yeah, we wear our hot mess hat with pride here, okay? <laughs> it takes a rebel to kick some, well, you know what. And now, Thursday night, buckle up for The Real Rebel at 8, 7 Central on ABC. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. I'm Kenneth Moden, and for Lindsay Davis, thanks for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Two people have been arrested for the freeway shooting death in California. You may recall the little boy was in the back seat of his mom's car on his way to kindergarten when he was shot. He died bleeding in her arms. Authorities say the suspects who are dating are in custody. Both are expected to be charged with murder. The Pentagon announced that the U.S. is about halfway through its military drawdown in Afghanistan. The top general in the Middle East said the U.S. is unscheduled to meet the president's September 11th deadline for a full withdrawal. Details like what security looks like when U.S. troops are gone are still being worked out, he added. And for the first time in 20 years, the FDA has approved a drug treating Alzheimer's. The drug is said to work against the disease itself versus just the symptoms. But its approval did come with controversy, with some experts saying the decision was ill-advised. Now to that major announcement from Justice Department officials today saying they have successfully recovered millions of dollars in cryptocurrency. The Colonial Pipeline paid hackers to get its pipeline back up and running last month. Senior White House correspondent Mary Bruce has the details. Tonight, the Justice Department announcing they've recovered millions of dollars in ransom money paid to Darkside, the Russian hackers who shut down the Colonial Pipeline. Today, we turned the tables on Darkside. The hack crippled pipeline operations for six days, triggering gas shortages and panic buying. The company ultimately paid the $4.3 million ransom. The CEO saying it was the right call. You don't want to pay these contemptible criminals, but our job and our, our duty is to the American public. It was the right decision to make for the country. The Justice Department now recovering $2.3 million by hacking the cyber criminal's Bitcoin wallet. Today, we deprived a cyber criminal enterprise of the object of their activity their financial proceeds and funding. These attacks have been on the rise. The nation's largest meat supplier, the target of a massive ransomware attack last week. The Massachusetts ferry to Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard also targeted. Earlier this year, New York's transit agency infiltrated by China. The Biden administration is now warning businesses to protect themselves, saying no company is safe. Pay attention now. Invest resources now. Failure to do so could be the difference between being secure now or a victim later. Our thanks to Mary Bruce there. President Biden is continuing to make his push for his trillion dollar infrastructure plan after cutting the price tag on it while rejecting the latest GOP counteroffer. But if he gets this priority, that's if he gets it passed, 
it will likely, most likely take some convincing from him to members of his own party as well. ABC's Alex Perche has the latest. Will the third time be the charm? President Biden's expected to resume talks on his infrastructure proposal this afternoon with lead GOP negotiator Senator Shelley Moore Capito after two other meetings ended without an agreement. The White House rejected the latest GOP counteroffer on Friday. Biden's already slashed his proposal significantly. Even moderate Democrats acknowledge that. The president has gone from two point two five trillion down to one trillion dollars. The Republicans have come up uh, quite a bit from where they started. But the main sticking point is how to pay for it. Biden dropped his calls for a corporate tax hike and instead proposed funding it through having companies pay a minimum 15 percent tax rate and through increased IRS enforcement. The Republicans want to avoid raising any taxes, paying for much of their own proposal using funds already approved by Congress. But now some progressive Democrats believe they're giving up too much, threatening to vote no on whatever compromise legislation comes out of Biden's negotiations with the GOP. Freshman Congressman Jamal Bowman saying this on CNN. I understand, you know, wanting to engage in bipartisanship, but they have not negotiated with us and tried to engage with us in good faith. Republicans believe these negotiations will set a tone. There's a bunch of Republicans like me that would do an infrastructure bill around a trillion dollars. Folks want a bipartisan deal. If we don't get there, then we'll consider other options. Our thanks to Alex Prochet there. Early voting in the Democratic primary for New York City's mayoral race starts this week with 13 candidates in the hunt to replace Mayor Bill de Blasio. And the debate over policing and how to tackle a rise in crime now a central issue in the race. So ABC News Chief Washington Correspondent Jonathan Carl traveled up to the Big Apple to take some to talk to some of the candidates vying to run America's biggest city. Welcome to the second debate of the Democratic candidates in the primary race for mayor of New York. In New York this week, eight candidates on a stage vying for one of the biggest political prizes of 2021. Spread apart, but in person and together. A sign that in politics, too, life is getting back to normal. I'm not a career politician. I'm not funded by a PAC. I have been your crisis manager. We need change and a fresh start. This race is a classic New York free-for-all, but it's also the largest election anywhere in the country by far since the end of the Trump presidency and since we've turned the corner on the pandemic. Back to normal, but there's something surprising happening in progressive New York City. While you might think this would be a race to the left, the leading candidates are talking tough on crime, opposing tax hikes, and about keeping businesses in New York. Last year's defund the police rallying cry not here, not now. What would you do to the overall budget for the NYPD? I have not been planning to make uh, changes to the budget. Uh, we will look at, at them from whether or not there are efficiencies to be found, but I believe we need to have our patrol strength uh, on the streets of New York. So what happened with the whole defund the police movement that was so big just, just last year? Defund the police is the wrong approach for New York City. Uh, most New Yorkers I talk to are very, very concerned about what's going on in their neighborhood. And if anything, they want to see more officers. And we need to go on a recruitment drive citywide for more officers. Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams is campaigning as a former cop who was also a victim of police brutality as a teenager. I'm Eric Adams. I'll be a blue collar mayor. I'll rebuild our economy while tackling violent crime and bring New York back. What's the number one issue in this race? A public safety. No one, you know, because public safety is really the foundation for all the issues. We can't turn around our economy if we're not safe. There are progressives in this race. Good afternoon. Maya Wiley just got a big endorsement from Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Thank you. Everybody, Maya Wiley! Wiley says she would take a billion dollars out of the police budget. We are going to stop the hiring in the next two police cadet classes. As I have said, we have a police department that is bloated. That has been a tougher argument to make when the city is in the midst of a rise in crime. The overall crime rate in New York City is up more than 20 percent since last year, and shooting incidents are up more than 70 percent. We caught up with candidate Andrew Yang on the campaign trail in Brooklyn, where he turned a heckler at a press conference. I want him to tell me when he do right, I will support him. Into a potential supporter. 
Yang is something of the celebrity candidate, breaking through in large part because he is well known from his run for president last year. Lately, he's become the biggest target. Man, harsh cover, New York Magazine. Who really wants Andrew Yang to be mayor? What, what's up with that? Well, a lot of people, apparently, because we have the most individual grassroots donors right here in New York City than any other candidate. Yang says public safety is not just about recruiting more cops, but also turning around the city's pandemic-ravaged economy. What about taxes? Right now would be the wrong time to raise taxes here in New York City. We do have $12 billion in federal aid or so, and a lot of families right now are looking around wondering whether this is the place for them to raise their family, to build a business. We cannot give people more reasons to start looking at places like Florida, because the reality is we need people who make a lot of money to pay their taxes right here in New York City. But the tough on crime, pro-business, no tax increases approach sounds a little bit like the early Mayor Bloomberg and maybe even Mayor Giuliani back in the day. Uh, I certainly admire Mike Bloomberg a great deal. And one thing I want to take from his example is hiring a group of world-class managers who are non-ideological, just results-oriented, just solving problems and getting things done for New York. As Yang faces criticism, he has no real experience to be mayor. The candidate who seems to be rising yeah. fastest is Catherine Garcia. Yeah. And for 14 years, my job has been to solve problems for New York. And I've got no plan to stop now. The city's former sanitation commissioner, Garcia's campaign is strikingly non-ideological. Her message is that she can do the job. She also says schools should be fully reopened already with in-person classes. And there's some resistance from the from the teachers unions on, on this. Yeah, I don't understand that. They're eligible to be vaccinated. We have our infectivity rate is almost zero at this point. Uh, we know from the beginning that young children weren't transmitting. Uh, we can do this safely and we need to do this safely. The Democratic primary is less than three weeks away. Whoever wins will face the daunting challenge of governing a place long ago called the ungovernable city and facing some of the toughest times in decades. I wrestled with people who carry knives on our subway system trying to assault someone. I'll be doing if I can't wrestle with everyday people. Is that, is that a good training to be mayor in New York? I, I think so. <laughs> we appreciate Jonathan Carl for that report. And still to come, more on that investigation to a hate crime in Canada, a family kill. Police say run over because of their faith. And more on the first senior royal ever born on U.S. soil. Will the name help men royal relations? In Australia, where I live, we've just had the worst bait of fatal shark encounters in a century. As someone who loves sharks and being in the water, why do you think they're coming closer to shores? I want to find out if we can live together without doing each other harm. Coexisting is really important. I couldn't agree with you more. They will come close. Don't make sharp movements. Should I be nervous? The biggest shark fest ever begins with the premiere of Shark Beach with Chris Hemsworth, Monday, July 5th at 9 on National Geographic. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. Do you 
reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several international headlines at this hour. Canadian authorities say they believe the four Muslim family members who were killed when a pickup truck jumped the curb and ran over them were deliberately targeted. Officials say the evidence showed the incident was motivated by hate. The suspect is in custody and has been charged with four counts of first-degree murder. Investigators in Pakistan are still in the scene of this deadly train accident that claimed at least 51 lives. It all began when an express train barreled into another train that had derailed minutes earlier. Pakistan has a history of deadly rail accidents, and officials say the track where this occurred was old and in need of repair. And David Dushman has died. His name may not ring a bell, but the legacy he leaves behind is an enduring one. The former Soviet soldier is believed to have been the last surviving liberator of the Auschwitz concentration camp. He drove his tank through its electric fence in 1945, but he said he didn't learn about the horrors committed there until after the war. He was 98 years old. In other news, Prince Harry and Meghan announced the birth of their daughter, Lilibet Diana Mountbatten Windsor. She's the first senior royal born in America, and the couple shared the news after returning home from the hospital in Santa Barbara. ABC's Kaylee Hartung has more on Lily's arrival and if it may help heal the royal rift. The Duke and Duchess of Sussex are celebrating the arrival of their second child, daughter Lilibet Diana, Lily for short. Born Friday at 11.40 a.m. at Santa Barbara Cottage Hospital in California, weighing 7 pounds 11 ounces, Lily is the first senior royal born in the U.S. The family's newest bundle of joy named in honor of a pair of important women in Harry's life, Lilibet, a family nickname for his grandmother, Queen Elizabeth, who couldn't pronounce her own name when she was little, and of course, Diana, for his beloved late mother. Meghan and Harry posting a message of thanks on their Archwell site, saying Lily is more than we could have ever imagined, and we remain grateful for the love and prayers we felt from across the globe. The couple adding that mother and daughter are healthy and well, and are settling in at home in Montecito. The royal family, the Queen, Prince Charles, Camilla, William and Kate all offering congratulations. The palace saying they are all delighted with the news of the birth of a daughter for the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. Relations between Harry and Meghan and the rest of the royal family have been recently notoriously strained. The couple accusing the palace of racism and callousness inside its walls in a bombshell interview with Oprah back in March. Meghan revealing insights into an apparent conversation before son Archie's birth in 2019. There is a conversation. Hold up. Hold up. There's Stop several right now. There are several conversations. There's a about conversation it. with you. With Harry. About how dark your baby is going to be? Potentially, and what that would mean or look like. It was during that interview that the couple also announced they were expecting a daughter. When you realize that and saw it on the ultrasound, what, what, what was your first thought? Amazing. Just grateful. Like, mm -hmm. Any, to have any child, any one or any two, would have been amazing. But to have a boy and then a girl, I mean, what more can you ask for? Some now wondering if Lilibet could help heal the royal rift. Nothing brings a family together like a new baby. And I think there's clearly so much joy about this baby's arrival. And particularly because they've included the royal family so much in her name, I think there's a real opportunity there for an increase in reconciliation. Our thanks to Kaylee Hartung there. Now to award-winning illustrator Julia Kay, who has always used her art to express her feelings. So when Julia began her gender transition five years ago, she decided to document in her comic strips to help her understand her profound emotional journey. Julia's comics have been compiled into two books. First, Super Late Bloomer, My Early Days in Transition in 2018, and the newly released follow-up, My Life in Transition. Julia Kay joins us now. Julia, welcome. Great to see you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me, Kenneth. 
Wonderful All right, so yeah, it's, um, it's great to have you. And I want to start with the first page of Super Late Bloomer, May 7th, 2016. Um, just as you started your transition, you write, I used to be better at ignoring my internal self-hatred. I could distract myself with new clothes. Body maintenance was new. Getting on hormones was an enormous relief, but reality has finally set in. There's nothing left to do but wait. Describe what you were going through at that time. Goodness, um, I was going through uh, clearly. Uh, start that uh, the book starts at a rocky place. I was in a very isolated uh, position, point in my life. Um, I was going through so many new experiences, navigating so much, um, dealing with dysphoria and not uh, and like like I said, like modifying my appearance to better suit my needs. Uh, just inundated with like all of the the, the nuances of the, the particulars of basically going through puberty in my late 20s, but without uh, anybody to guide me. Uh, and just knowing that, you know, it, like I had a long road ahead of me. Uh, it was very exciting, it was a very fulfilling period. But after a while, there, there, was nothing, there was nothing that could be done, but you know, for time to do its thing. It's and difficult. both. And in both Super Late Bloomer and Life in Transition, you share very intimate and often uncomfortable feelings. Why is it so important for you to share such personal moments with your readers? You know, the, the books, they started as, um, well, they were both basically therapy for myself to help me navigate um, my life. Uh, um, and I felt that in doing so, in stepping away from like creating for anyone but myself, I could like bring about this raw honesty that's was just really important to bring about the, the nuance of the lived experience. I, I had a lot of trouble um, finding media that I felt that reflected the the, the day-in, day-out experience of transition that wasn't sugar-coated, that really showed all of the ups and downs. Um, because you know, you're, you're dealing with so many highs and lows just constantly and so much anxiety about the way you're perceived and that your own self-perception, your own self growing self-acceptance over time. Um, I did, just didn't see anything out in the world that really truly reflected my experience. And I, I felt it was important to create something that's, um, that, that would help others feel less isolated in their own experiences. We do our homework around here, Julia. We searched the uh, tweet archives there. Uh, just three weeks ago, you tweeted, my gender identity is hot girl, and I love that for me. What did it take for you to get to that place? <laughs> uh, goodness, uh, a, lot of, a lot of therapy, um, lived experience. Um, honestly, like early on transition, like so much of it was just hypotheticals and like going through things the first time, but like, uh, as I just lived as myself out in the world, uh, my own self-acceptance grew. I, um, I found a community in others who went, who had walked the same path, who were, who were trans as well, who would understand the nuance of my own experience, uh, of like we could share our experiences. Um, and just it normalized everything. That's really what it comes down to. I had so little uh, trans representation to look to in my life uh, when I was starting out that I, it just felt like I, I was this 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 buoy that was just like um, bouncing up and down in the in the ocean alone. But it turns out that there are so there's so many of us, and uh, it's yeah, it's, it's it's all just been about normalizing the experience um, and <laughs> yeah, just just embracing uh, yourself and really coming into yourself and yeah, bring bringing about that confidence is that hot girl energy. Yes. Hot girl summer, here we come. Uh, so yeah, five years since you've transitioned and so much has changed in terms of trans visibility. As you know, your books and Instagram account being great examples of that. How has your work and that of others, how's it changed the game for all audiences? God, we're in such a different world now. It's, it's incredible. When I came out um, to like my parents, I felt like there was nothing I could just readily give to them to help uh, help them understand where I'm coming at. Like anything short of like uh, what felt like dry uh, academic literature or like full scale novels. Uh, like being able to put out a book like um, Super Like Blue or My Life in Transition um, has enabled so many trans people to be able to see themselves reflected in it and be able to share that with the people in their lives. 
like I, I love hearing that like people uh, will give it to their parents or their family members and be like, here, uh, I understand it opens up a bridge to a conversation. And on social media, like there's like so many um, people on TikTok that are trans just talking openly talking about their experiences. There's so many people in the media. There's so many people, YouTubers. Like it's it's a completely different planet than five years ago, uh, and particularly the youth now have you know they are able to better explain and understand themselves. Uh, it's it's incredible. It's, it's empowering. Empowering is right. Uh, trans visibility so important, so brave, so courageous. Thank you for being you. Thank you for sharing yourself, Julia K. It's just great to see you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kenneth. Have a good one. And you can find Julia Kay's work on Instagram, Twitter, and her super late bloomer collection is available wherever books are sold. Turning now to the slow process of recovery for a Southern city, Lake Charles hit by a string of natural disasters with volunteers stepping up to help as the city waits to hear about more federal aid. ABC, ABC's Rob Marciano's travel, or ABC's Rob Marciano traveled there to see how the community responded. Two hurricanes, an ice storm, and an epic flood, all in nine months. Water was up to here. Like so many in Lake Charles, Kevin Guidry, former NFL and LSU football star, has been hit hard by them all. People right now, mentally, that's the biggest thing. When you walk around and talk to your neighbors, you feel a sense of sadness. He was fixing damage from the first three disasters, then another flood. We had contractors in that were, that were doing stuff. And all of that got put on hold, stopped. The mayor of Lake Charles losing patience, waiting for Congress to approve supplemental funding. There are Americans suffering here in southwest Louisiana, and we have not received the same proper commensurate federal response that other natural disasters have received. Senator Bill Cassidy pleading the case to Congress last month to no avail. We cannot afford to allow the impact of an entire year's worth of natural disasters to go unaddressed. FEMA telling ABC News they have been in the area since before Hurricane Laura and continue to work in Lake Charles to assist survivors by providing grants, loans and housing to those who are eligible. Since Hurricane Laura, FEMA has approved more than $1.1 billion in statewide assistance. That's nearly 300 million individual assistance dollars, more than 650 million in SBA disaster loans, and nearly 150 million in national flood insurance claims. And where the government isn't, volunteer missions have stepped in, many from Texas. Right now, we're just cleaning it up. We took uh, everything out of the house. You can see the debris pile here. Everything that was in the house was wet and spoiled and beginning to accumulate mold. For many in Lake Charles, it's the kindness of these strangers that needs the most. But the one thing is, we're going to make it. Incredible community there. Our thanks to Rob Marciano. And that's our show for tonight. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Kenneth Moten and for Lindsay Davis. Thanks for streaming with us. In Australia, where I live, We've just had the worst spate.